All right, I'm going to start the broadcast. And then I'll change things over to you. Okay. Ready? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. This is Rocio from SAGNI. Uh, today, we have Paul Kiwanipa, the um, Michigan Promotional Professionals Association. He's the executive director there. He will be presenting to us on how to sell to every generation of buyer. We thank you so much for um, joining us. Um, Paul, thank you for doing this presentation. And I'm changing everything to you now, OK? All right. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them out in the questions panel. Um, I will be reading them out to Paul as we go. Um, and there you go, Paul. All yours. All right. Hopefully my screen is up. Yes, I see it. <clears throat> All right. Well, thank you. And welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Paul I'm the executive director of MIPA. My contact information is on this front page, and it will be on uh, on some of the following pages. I also have a handout that I've prepared that I'll be sending uh, over to Sagni, and uh, she'll be able to uh, to make sure that you get uh, get a copy of that. Uh, how do we sell to any generation, and, and why is that important? PPAI has gone through uh, some extensive strategic planning, and they identified the generational shifts, the globalization, and the technology as being the three major drivers of the changes that we're seeing. And this is affecting all of us. Um, no matter what generation we individually are a part of, um, it, it's affecting how we sell and how we're going to be selling in the future. So today, in the next uh, 50 minutes or so, I'm going to cover how can you identify the generational influences among your buyers. And I'll try to make it uh, clear of why that might be important to you. Uh, everyone has a different preferred method to be contacted, and that can affect how you sell and, and how you develop relationships. I'm going to touch on how you want to engage each generation. What works with a baby boomer may turn off a millennial. What, what uh, gets a millennial excited may get a... Uh, <laughs> what's in it for me from, from a Gen Xer. And we're going to talk about how we can build relationships with each of the generations. Today is unique. For one, for uh, this unique period in history, we, we have four generations that are all still in the workplace. And each generation is defined by the circumstances that, uh, that they experienced as they were growing up, uh, that influence their worldview, their point of view, and all these things are very distinctive. It's uh, one thing that's very clear, however, is that you are born into your generation. It's not like as you age, you shift into a different generation. Uh, and also, another important thing to uh, keep in mind is that um, things that affected a generation have a little bit of crossover. So you may be born in, say, 1981, and you may have some attributes of a millennial and more attributes of a Gen Xer. And I'm going to talk about where those, uh, those dates start. When you think about it, what generation? If you have to contact a customer, what type of communication do you prefer most? Which generation is going to prefer face-to-face -face communication? Which generation is going to prefer being reached by text? Another generation is really going to prefer to be called by phone, and another one through email. So we look at these, the uh, silent generation, or the matures, they like face-to-face -face communications. When you're calling on uh, someone who's a member of that generation, making a cold call, they may actually let you back and, and sit down and talk to you. If you're trying to reach a millennial, they're going to much prefer being reached by text. Us old baby boomers still use the telephone, surprisingly or not. And when I listen to baby boomers who are out there selling us, they're still going, why don't they return my call? I left a voicemail 25 times. Why aren't they calling me back? It's probably because they're calling a different generation. And Xers uh, seem to prefer the uh, um, email. It also affects which generation, how they like to be rewarded. Some prefer to be rewarded by money. 
others are going to be looking for vacation, others for title and recognition, and others for compensation and a, well, a job well done. Generation Xers were the inventors of the term work-life balance. They're going to want a vacation. They're going to want to spend time with family. Us boomers, we were the me generation. I used to have an I love me wall at my office with all the plaques and awards and so on that uh, that I'd received. Uh, and if you did notice on my entry screen with my name, Paul A. Kiwi, M-A-S plus C-I-P, um, every uh, certified coach, CPC, uh, I've even put on sometimes CC, Confident Communicator, which came from uh, uh, Toastmasters. That's very reflective of us how, how us baby boomers like to be uh, rewarded and recognized. So what generation? How can we tell them? One generation rebelled and challenged authority when they were teenagers. <clears throat> another had high respect for their parents. For another generation, friends were more important than family. And for others, they counted on your, their parents for guidance and advice. And again, us baby boomers, we were known for that rebellion, and we thought every kid was going to rebel when they turned, uh, become teenagers. The generous boomers, the mature, brought up in more of a strict hierarchical type system and were taught respect your parents. You never talk back to your parents. Uh, for Gen Xers, another one of the things they got to invent was they were called the latchkey kids. Uh, they really saw the shift of both parents working, were handed a key to the house to put in their backpack and go home and hang out with friends, and, and friends became more important than family. And then you may have heard the, the term helicopter parent referring to the parents of millennials. I've heard of anecdotes of uh, millennials showing up for job interviews with their parents, and the, the relationship with uh, a millennial with their parents is, uh, is very, very tight. So let's talk about the uh, traditionalists. Traditionalists are sometimes called the silent generation because they fell in between the greatest generation, that was World War II vets, uh, and us baby boomers who thought the world owed us everything because that's just the way we're brought up. Traditionalists were born between uh, 1925 and 1945. Uh, so that puts them at 71 and over. Are there still some in the workplace? Yeah. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending if they really want to work, but uh, with uh, the changes in the economy and so on, many of them are still in the workplace. I think in our jobs, when we're calling on a traditionalist, we're more likely to be calling on the owner of a company or um, uh, someone who has some sort of ownership in the company and, and is still uh, hanging in there and making decisions around the company. Con uh, the company, yes. Uh, they're very much team players. Uh, they they were uh, come from a background of a lot of structure. Uh, they um, the the family was pretty sacred. Divorce was pretty much unheard of uh, as they were growing up. So very solid nuclear family type values around them. You can call them up. They'll answer the phone on the on the first ring. You can send them a letter, and when you call them and refer to the letter, they'll they'll recognize that. There's about 40 million of them um, still uh, alive and, and uh, in the United States, and they have an average household income of around $40,400. Uh, the matures, they have this defining idea. All of us have kind of a defining idea that are, is kind of like the tagline or the descriptor for our generation, and for the uh, matures, it's duty very strong sense of duty that is shown through their patriotism, um, the way they handle their um, obligations to their church and service organizations. Uh, you know, this is the group that built the Optimist Club and the Rotaries and, and uh, all of those service clubs with that strong sense of duty. When it came to money, they had a very strong uh, ideal of what you do is you earn it, you put it away, and you pay cash. You buy your car, and then you start saving to replace it when, when that one wears out. You buy a washing machine, and you put the money away so that if that one breaks, you can fix it. When you think of how they grew up and, and what the technology of their day was, 
Who has slide rules and rotary phones? And it's amazing that this group is still in, in the workforce, and it's also amazing when you think of just how much things have changed over the last several years. The picture on my slide is of their defining business icon. One of the wealthiest men in the world, Warren Buff Buffett, would fit under the uh, silent or mature or traditional uh, generation. Uh, television came into its own and, and was also a defining technology for them. So it's 9 o'clock. Where are you going to find them? You'll find them at home. They grew up with the music of Frank Martin, <laughs> Frank Martin, Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra. And for them, the idea of work was just, was just inevitable. Everybody has to go to work. You have to do it. An inevitable obligation. And education, a dream. Something that you might aspire to and something that was highly valued but also kind of out there. Thinking about them, what were their defining moments? What are the things that kind of shaped those ideals and values that you see for them? For one, it was the Great Depression. Now, my mother was actually part of the greatest generation, but my mother used to sew socks. I guess she called it darning socks. I mean, all of the things that we take for granted that if it breaks or rips or tears, we, we throw it away. My parents, um, they, they fixed everything because they had gone through that, that Great Depression period. And many of the traditionalists, particularly the oldest ones, born in 25, they've, uh, uh, they experienced the Great Depression as, as young, impressionable children. They also saw the New Deal. They saw uh, Roosevelt come in with the progressive uh, agenda that really turned the country around. It, it brought us out of the Great Depression. It uh, brought about the, uh, uh, the boom of the 1950s and that uh, 1950s kind of idealism that, that you think of when you think of the uh, Leave it to Be Beavers and Daddy Knows Best uh, uh, type shows. And half the people listening to me probably have no idea what this said um, does. For them, the day that will live in infamy, the day that everybody knew exactly where they were, was Pearl Harbor. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, everybody could tell you, I was coming out of church that day, or I was uh, having breakfast with, with my family when the radio came on and, and the Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. They were shaped by World War II and, and how World War II was such a, a war with, with a purpose uh, of defeating Hitler, of defeating, uh, it was a good versus evil and, and we triumphed. They also saw that first mushroom cloud and the change of the world that the atomic bomb and the atomic age brought to it. And when I said that education was a dream, part of that uh, New Deal was the GI Bill, which suddenly made college uh, affordable and allowed them, uh, or uh, allowed them to uh, uh, achieve a college education. World War II didn't take long, and we were right back into another war, the Korean War, and that, of course, followed by the Cold War. And all of those type of events really affected uh, affected this, the silent generation. If you want to reach a silent, so if, you, if you've got some prospects that are owning a business, running a business, making the decisions, when you engage them, you want to introduce yourself. And you need to show them a great deal of respect. They earned it by virtue of their age, their life experience, and they feel that they need to be respected. Don't use their first name without them telling you to. Um, and ask for and play by their rules. As you've introduced yourself and, and uh, have, have started the engagement, you can ask, hey, do you prefer that I call you or would you rather have me write you or, or send you an email? And play by the way they want to uh, interact with you. Quality is very important. Again, that kind of goes to that Great Depression feeling of everything needs to last. So quality is important. With them, you can mention this is American made or, or this is 100% cotton and all of those things that would go into sending a quality message as you're presenting. Like many uh, generations, they like testimonials, particularly testimonials from names they're going to recognize, either a, an established company that you've worked with or perhaps somebody in the community that they would know of or if you got to meet them through a referral or reference, 
using something that they're going to be able to relate to in that testimonial is going to make it more powerful. You need to keep in touch with them. This is a group that you can follow up with, with, hey, it's been a month since I talked to you. What's been going on? Is there anything I can be doing for you? Uh, they respond to that, and they're not going to resent it. However, you do need to, that's pretty much goes for everybody, but again, with this group, if you fail them, uh, you're probably not going to get back to them. Make it easy for them, and this is particularly true in the technology area. Uh, the older the people are in, in the various generations, the less experience they've had with, with uh, um, technology. You're not going to find a lot of early adapters to technology within this group. So you need to make it very easy to them, uh, for them. They may not be that comfortable receiving a proposal by email. Get to know that ahead of time and so that you can deliver something that you've printed out or um, they may not be comfortable looking for something on your website. So you may want to be more careful about delivering the information. The big thing is to show your dedication, to show that you're really into uh, helping them and solving their problems. Another question here, which generation is the median buyer of Harley-Davidson motorcycles? Which generation was named the Time Magazine's Man of the Year? Which generation would say their career goal is to build a stellar career? And which one prefers work feedback once a year with lots of documentation? Aha, I get to talk about myself, the baby boomers. The baby boomers uh, used to be the biggest generation ever. <laughs> and and uh, we, we had a major impact, particularly on the uh, generation that follows us, which I'll be getting to. 1946 to 1964. Real easy to remember that because uh, you just flip the four and the six. You go from 1946 to 1964. That's uh, when, when us baby boomers. Uh, it, reply, it refers to all of those troops coming home after World War II, getting married, making babies, and boy did the population explode. And it exploded at a time of great social change as well as technology changes, not to the extent that the next two generations have seen, but society in general. And we were spoiled brats, basically. Um, you'll find you'll find us uh, aged 51 to 69 today. Uh, so a lot of uh, as this baby boomer generation has boomed, um, a lot of us are are hitting retirement age, um, which is also having a major effect on society. But must confess, we're a pretty self-absorbed group. Um, our parents did everything they could for us. They did everything to make sure that we did better than they did, but at it. Um, and so we tended to be very self-absorbed. Now talk about some of those uh, qualities that you'll that will reinforce that point. But also, we saw the beginning of the disintegration of the nuclear family. Our generation started seeing our parents' divorce. Um, of dad leaving, of uh, mom leaving, of living with, with one or the other parent. Prior to that, the idea of a, a single parent was, was pretty rare in the United States, and we started experiencing that. But I can say, and be, be comfortable bragging about, we are hardworking, goal-oriented, and we're very comfortable in hierarchies. By that, we were taught early on, if you want it, you go for it, and and you, if you go for it, you're going to get it. And when you look at all of the success books and the self-help books that were written in, say, the 80s when we were really coming into the workplace uh, and, and making our mark, um, it was all about setting goals and, and accomplishing things of how to make a million dollars by flipping houses, and anybody can get into real estate, and anybody can do this. And But we're also very comfortable in hierarchies, basically meaning Here's the ladder of success. We knew that if you were a brand manager, you needed to work at becoming a, 
uh, a marketing manager so that you might become the director of, of sales and then you might be able to cross over and become vice president of marketing or vice president of sales and that might lead to the presidency and, and so on. It was very clear, here's the ladder, here's success, go do it. Very comfortable on the phone. Uh, we're still of uh, most, for the most part, a call me generation. So when you're you're thinking, okay, this guy I've got to reach is in his mid si mid sixties, good chance you might be able to get through to him on the phone. And I mentioned the household income for the uh, uh, silence at forty thousand. Average household income in the United States for a baby boomer fifty nine thousand eight hundred. So that generation before did set us up nicely. Here I've got a picture of our business icon. This guy is, uh, I hate to say it, he's two years younger than me. Uh, Bill Gates is uh, going to be 61 this year um, and the wealthiest man in the world. And he's a baby boomer. And I love our defining idea, individuality. Um, we really like the idea that we're all unique and, and we've all got our own goals and we're all going for it. Yet yeah, we're also the generation that oh, we all had to have members only. We all had to have a BMW. We all had to have uh, this brand or that brand. So, um, but I guess that's not that uh, different from uh, that. May be pretty much a universal trait. Uh, that part of of wanting to be different, but just like everybody else. When it comes to money, though. <laughs> Uh, we like to criticize the government for spending money it doesn't have. That was us boomers. Uh, buy it. Buy it now. We're going to make enough money to pay for it later. Um, we want the the McMansion. Go ahead and buy it. Our salary will, will catch up with us and we'll catch up with our house payment. We want the BMW. We want the Mercedes or uh, other luxury vehicle. Buy it now. We'll worry about how to pay for it later. And that's... Uh, pretty much the way the boomers are. Uh, when selling it to them, it <laughs> makes them an easy sale because they're much more easy to say yes, but you may have a collection issue with some of them. Our technology, I remember when uh, Texas Instruments had calculators that cost more than uh, iPads do today, and, and that would be in $1970. Um, calculators could run two, $300 when they came out. Pretty amazing. Um, and even though we still say we're going to dial somebody up on the phone, where for us the touch tone phones came out, and quite frankly, it was a, a pretty big deal. Also, a big breakthrough technology for us was the fax machine. Uh, MIPA just got rid of its fax number, and from the time I've been executive director, we've never had a fax machine. But for boomers, boy, the amazing miracle of putting a picture here and having it come out on the other end. My first fax machine weighed probably 120 pounds and used thermal paper that, that curled up and the message on it disappeared after about a month, but um, amazing technology. So it's 9 o'clock. Where do you find a boomer? <laughs> We're still in the office slaving away because we just love work so much. Um, we just think work's an exciting adventure, and the more we work, the harder we work, the more we're going to get. And I'm guilty of that. Uh, my wife's a teacher and, and has conferences tonight. And last night when she said, uh, going to be late tomorrow night, probably won't be home till about 9 because of the conferences, I'm like, yes, I can work late tomorrow. Yes, we're a strange generation, but we're big. But boy, did we have the music. And <laughs> the best part of being my age is, is the, uh, the groups we had. Certainly the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were two of them, but uh, all of the great music, I'll say unequivocally, is the music us boomers brought. I know. I'm going to have some disagreement out there. But we also grew up with, you know, college, well, that's just a birthright. Uh, it was part of, you know, you, you go to school, you go to high school, you get your high school diploma, and then what college are you going to go to? But our defining moments, the Cold War, uh, as I... Um, indicated by my age comparison to uh, Bill Gates. I'm 63, and uh, the picture there of kids hiding under a desk, yes, we actually thought that that was going to protect us from an atomic bomb. I remember having nightmares of being attacked by the Russians because it was just part of the national conversation that 
a nuclear war could break out. Um, I don't have it listed as a defining uh, moment, but actually the Cuban Missile Crisis, we were on the brink of a nuclear war with, with Russia, and I was just a small child. I was probably about 10, 9 or 10 years old when that happened. But remembering the news and my parents and people talking about what if Khrushchev doesn't doesn't back down. What if they sh they shoot a missile, a nuclear missile from Cuba into the United States? And Vietnam. I remember uh, a summer vacation with the boys, uh, all of us in high school, and and listening to the radio as as they called off our draft numbers. And so Skip had to rush rush from camp and and signed up for the National Guard and and. And Rusty immediately signed up for the Marines because he knew he was going to go. And I was fortunate. I had number 136. I was kind of on the bubble. Uh, they were talking about going to 130 that year uh, for the draft. Protesting the war. You know, shall I go downtown and protest this week? Shall I wear a black armband? And then, of course, I was in fifth grade when Mr. Ehlers came into the room when we got back from recess and said school is being let out. President Kennedy has been shot. I remember my fear when Martin Luther King was assassinated, thinking the entire world was going to burn up, and and then not long after that, uh, RFK, Robert Kennedy, uh, leaving Los Angeles, saying, and now on to Chicago, and, and being shot down. Those sort of things were never part of the national consciousness before and they became part of the baby boomers in defining. And then, of course, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, we defined it. Uh, we, we made it happen, and Woodstock was an example of that, and, and the whole thing of all of this great music, but also uh, the freedom, the, the changes uh, that society was going through is, were kind of all wrapped up in Woodstock. The 1968 Democratic Convention and images of policemen with billy clubs beating protesters uh, Ten soldiers and Nixon coming, the Kent State uh, incident, uh, had a strong effect on me. And then, of course, during our coming of age time, uh, the pill was invented, a sexual revolution happened, uh, the Roe versus Wade decision, and then, of course, uh, towards fashionable moments, um, we had a president lying to us and, and the whole Watergate scandal that came about. So with all of those things affecting us, how do you sell to boomers? Well, for the most part, we are an optimistic bunch. Maybe it's because of the stuff we went through, but we always felt like it's going to get better. Um, and a, a boomer is more likely to say, well, you know, when you reach the bottom, you can only go up and, and be very optimistic. Um, so you can present scenarios as you're selling to them of good things happening, and, and a boomer is probably going to nod their head because we like looking towards the positive. As I mentioned, uh, individuality, uh, we like to express it with, with name brands. We created that whole boom of luxury goods and, and semi-luxury goods and luxury brands. So when you're selling to a, a boomer, if you're selling from uh, one of the lines that have some of those brands, and uh, you know which ones I'm talking about. Uh, you know, just do it. Uh, uh, you know, there's uh, um, Eddie Bauer. There's, uh, I shouldn't even get into it because I'll miss too many. But there's some great, great brands in our industry. Use them because uh, the boomers are going to be looking for brand names and they're going to uh, respond to that. They like a personal relationship, uh, person to person. This is a good group. If you can afford it, to take them out to lunch um, and and try to get to know them on a on a personal level. We're very much into teamwork, and and it's important for you to position yourself as being one of the team that you want to be part of their team. Because of that individuality um, theme that runs through them, customization and personalization are important. And when you've got products that you can make it custom, so it's totally unique to them or if you can put their name on it and personalize it, it's going to have a strong effect. When I was selling, one of the uh, techniques I used with, with my targeted accounts that worked very well was rather than sending them a sample with my logo on it, I would do a personalized item, such as I do a pad folio with the, the little plate on it 
with it engraved with the, the buyer's name. And then I would um, send an accompanying note talking about the personalized service I was going to give them. Again, people, boomers in particular, give me something with my name on it. I'm not tossing it out, and I'm going to take notice. You can go ahead and sell. Um, we had all those self-help books. We had all those sales books. We had the Carnegie training, and we've had the... Um, uh, We've, we've had all of these different types of sales training. We recognize selling, and we can actually appreciate it. And when somebody's good at it, it's like, wow. So go ahead and don't be afraid to build a person with them. We like to see that somebody's working hard. We've got that work ethic, and so when someone else has demonstrated that work ethic, we can appreciate it. We like to be courted. I had great success taking people to lunch because I was selling boomer to boomer. They like to be courted. They like getting that personalized uh, sample from, from you. When you're calling on someone and you're not sure if they're an extra or a boomer, look for the plaques and the uh, awards and so on, other signs of accomplishment, uh, and then compliment them on it. Uh, make it a point. If you're calling on somebody and they've got something on their wall or they've got something on the desk behind themselves, feel free to uh, mention it and compliment them on it because they like that. Um, with boomers, there's a great range of diversity in terms of our comfort level with technology. I'm a boomer that a lot of people think, wow, he's really tech savvy. I'm not very tech savvy, but I suppose for my age I may be. But there's also people in the boomer range that have been total laggards. They they still have AOL and Hotmail accounts, and and uh, they they still um, have never really worked at, at getting comfortable with technology. That's important again for you as you're getting more technical. Not, um, as you're putting forth proposal level of technology, you need to make sure that um, the buyer that you're calling on is comfortable with that. Appeal to their ego. Like I mentioned, I've got E-I-E-I-O behind my name. Um, that's an ego thing. <laughs> it's very much a boomer thing. Um, like I would mentioned earlier, look for those signs of accomplishment and appeal to them. But it can go all those that they've got crazy socks or fancy shoes or you happen to notice that you know they've got a um, Armani suit on. Mention it. Um, make them visionary. We like to think that uh, we're at that age where we've seen it all and we can uh, move things forward. Presenting that means showing them what the world can look and when you're pre look like after they have a relationship with you, purchasing relationship. But when they buy from you. They're buying at a higher level. They're, they're buying from somebody who understands their business. They're buying somebody from somebody who's bringing them a vision of the future. Uh, we like nostalgia, um, no doubt about that. You can look at the stores that uh, have, have gone with that nostalgic type look. Um, and there's a lot of things in our industry that can bring up nostalgia of doing printing with distressed looks and, and some of the other um, type of looks that that can create that going to uh, uh, respond to. Don't badmouth their kids. And by that mean I mean they proud their kids are probably millennials, so don't be don't be um, disrespecting uh, their children or the, the generation that their children come from. Again, when you're calling on somebody you'll see on their desk if they've got pictures um, of their kids and so on, involve that. If they're playing soccer or if they're in college or if they just had a baby. Uh, um, you know, a lot of us boomers are, are now becoming grandparents and that's, that's good common ground for talking to them about. Introducing a new generation and which generation would this be? It's been called the sales-proof generation. I know as a salesperson you're probably not liking to hear that. They're most likely to view salespeople as desperate and dishonest. Yikes. Uh, it's the average home buyer today. And it's the first American generation to be less, less affluent than their parents. The founders of Dell, Google, and Yahoo all are part of this generation. 
yay, the Gen Xers. And this is where I get to uh, uh, insult most, probably most of my audience, uh, unfortunately. Actually, I love Gen Xers. Much like the silence we're sandwiched in between this great big gener uh, greatest generation and this outgoing, crazy, and huge by size uh, baby boomer generation, <clears throat> Gen Xers got squeezed behind what was the biggest generation, boomers, and what is now the biggest generation ever, millennials, and they were squeezed in between them. Gen Xers <clears throat> are now 34 to 50 years old. Um, they're very entrepreneurial. I mentioned these. this was the first generation that were latchkey kids, where they were basically giving a lot of, an awful lot of responsibility at a very young age. And this was the generation that created that whole term of work-life balance. They crave it, and they can be very skeptical of authority. This is a group that prefers to be reached by email. Uh, there's 60 million of them, and I mentioned the uh, boomers in thousand uh, generation X actually is doing less well than the uh, the generation before them, which creates um, among them uh, a lot of cynicism, and we'll talk about that. Their defining idea: diversity. Uh, suddenly. Uh, a generation that was trained other thoughts and, and, and ideas and open to that. Again, from, from a money standpoint, this group is cautious. They're more likely to be saving their money, um, squirreling it away, uh, and, and hanging on to it. Their technology was the first spreadsheets, the first cell phones, no computers, and, and first Macs. Um, Quite a big leap from the uh, the fax machines that, that us boomers thought were so swell, and uh, <clears throat> a pretty. It's nine o'clock. Where do you find your boom your uh, Gen Xer? Well, the uh, traditionalist was was at home relaxing, maybe in bed. The boomer was still working, and the Gen Xer is going to be home, but probably putting those kids to bed, spending time with the family, maybe playing a game with the family. They were defined with music from Madonna, Nirvana. Uh, Nirvana in particular being a kind of an indicator of the, the type of uh, uh, underflowing themes that, that uh, this, this generation uh, had to encounter. For them, we're much uh, uh, an exciting adventure like the boomers thought, but a difficult challenge. And education, yeah, you do it because you need it. It's it's a way to get where you want it to go. <clears throat> Their defining moments were the negative effects of those boomers we had on them, our, our baby boomer pop culture. Um, they were young enough, old enough and young enough to have uh, also experienced the government lying to them, the, the President of the United States um, committing a crime and, and covering it up and, and the whole Watergate scandal. They saw some crazy runaway inflation from time to time. Uh, they saw um, they saw the, the prime interest rate hit 16%. That's how much the uh, inflation was, was going crazy. They saw the United States get disrespected as Iran grabbed 40 Americans and held them hostage. And, and, uh, and then the frustration of, of the uh, uh, government sending in a helicopter rescue and, and having our helicopters crash and, and burn in the desert. But they were the first to get MTV, and believe it or not, back back in those days, MTV actually showed music video, television. Uh, Hello, Paul. Hey, Paul, I think we have lost you. We don't uh, hear your audio. Am I on? There you go. Okay, sorry. Um, Thank you. Did I get through hostage? Where did you lose me? Hostage crisis? MTV and cable TV. Okay, MTV and cable TV. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> All right. Um, the 
Challenger disaster. Uh, this is, again, one of those real telling type uh, events. If you ask a baby boomer, when I say the word NASA, what do you think of? A baby boomer is going to reply, that's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And that's what, what do you think, or Xer, what do you think of when I say the word NASA? And they're going to say, the Challenger disaster. Uh, they saw this incurable killer disease, AIDS, come onto the uh, front. They saw the President of the United States selling arms in exchange for hostages with the Iran-Contra affair. Uh, they experienced the Persian Gulf War, the fall of Berlin, the O.J. Simpson trial. Uh, the VCR, CD, and PC all came about, and then, of course, the development of the World Wide Web. But what I want to point out in particular are the Watergate, um, inflation, Iran, Challenger, AIDS, Iran-Contra. Here us optimistic boomers were telling them all the things about how great everything is and how you can trust the government and how our our advanced advances in our great nation is going to take us into space and we're going to take one of your teachers and put them into space. Have we disappointed this generation or what? I mean, every time we turned around, we couldn't seem to get enough of, uh, of disappointing them. So there's a high level of cynicism among Generation Xers. They've been lied to an awful lot. And uh, so it's not a criticism of them that they're cynical. <laughs> Boy, did, did we... We give them the right to have that. Selling them, be brief and to the point. As soon as you start getting real um, colorful and, and uh, adding a lot of fluff and puff, they see that immediately and think of it as a phony and tell them what you're there for and get right to the point. When you're selling to them, make sure you list all the available I mean, if you've got something that comes in 12 colors, show them all 12 colors. If you only show them three, there's a good chance they've already done their homework and research, and they're th they'll be thinking, why is he holding back on me? Why is she not telling me about this? So be very open about all of the different options that they have. Number three is be authentic. I mentioned they can spot a phony a mile away, and you're not going to get past their internal gatekeeper if you come across as being fake. If you're really there to make um, sure that you're coming across as being authentic with it. Be able to back up all your claims, either with, uh, with, with some sort of solid proof. This is probably a good generation to be talking about product safety with and, and showing those type of proofs. If you've got case histories or if you're using a case history, have it printed out so that they can look at it. And with this group, peer referrals are golden. And when I say peer referrals, I mean Xer to Xer. Um, that's what's going to get their attention and, and make you believable. Also, when you come to them with solutions, have some sort of immediacy to it, some sort of immediate application uh, that they can put it to. Um, I mentioned their business icon. I must have slipped right by the picture. Jeff Be Bezos uh, from Amazon would be, be an example. Michael Dell from, from Dell Computers, the founders of, of Yahoo. So you want to don't develop relationships with Xers. I like this time cover. You called us slackers. You dismissed us as Generation X. We'll move over. We're not through with you yet. Um, they've have some wonderful values and they've they have brought some great changes to the value systems like I've already mentioned work work life balance a couple of times this group is going to value time over money so honor that make sure that you're very respectful of their time and, and realize that um, that they they highly value their time the time they're spending with you, they could be doing something that they find more balance with. So, so make sure you honor that. If the product or the solution that you're proposing to them has a, a great time savings, point that out to them. Um, it may be good to point out if, 
if this particular person is buying online to be pointing out that you're going to save them time because you're going to do the proofing, you're going to make sure the artwork's correct, you're going to make sure you're going to be doing this follow-up and point out all of the things that are going to save them time. Offer them a whole range of options, always have a plan B ready and get them involved in the process. If you can somehow encourage them to add something to your proposal, to add some thoughts about the strategies and, and uh, the direction that you're taking with it. Um, get them involved in that way. Be very efficient in your communications. Educate them on the industry. Um, go ahead and, and, and let them know what the industry is about. If there's an end user show in your, your region, um, this is a great group to bring to, the, to an end user show. And now shifting to another generation, I guess none of us would be able to guess which generations 40% have a tattoo and 20% have more than one. Uh, this generation is going to feel guilty about littering or not recycling a can, but they'll illegally download videos for free without a flinch. Uh, over 90% use text messaging and social media daily. More than 25% have a pierced body part other than an ear. 75% of them will switch suppliers with just one bad experience and 85% of them are going to tell others about it. Yes, we are talking about Generation Y, also known as the Millennials. This is the group as shown in the cartoon here, sending a text to each other. So great having breakfast with you. I know we should do it every Saturday. This is the group I've been on companies where I'm talking to one person, I say, hey, shall we invite, invite uh, Kathleen to join us for lunch? Yes, and she sends a text, and it's like the next cubicle over. I can raise my head and pop my head over the, uh, the cubicle and ask her, but we're going to do it text to text. Millennials are now 22 to 34 years old. I, that screen, they were born between 1982 and 1994. This group is very worldly. Um, they grew up in in the age of globalization and have a much broader global view where Gen Xers were more likely that had been split uh, apart. Millennials, many of them are from merged families. They have half brothers and sisters and, and uh, their, their dad's kids and their mom's kids and, and they're one of them but families have merged together. This group really prefers flexible work. They like to have input in their projects. Uh, to reach them, it's text me or hit me up on Facebook. And this is a big group, 85 million. This is the first group that came around that was bigger than the baby boomers. Um, a group of 40 million, baby boomers 80 million, Gen X through 60 million, and wow, look at this group, 85 million. They control over $160 billion in, in uh, um, wealth. Their annual incomes haven't been calculated yet. Some of them aren't, you know, are, are still in college and so on. So, But they're going to make up um, the majority of the workforce by 2020. So this is a group that more and more of you are finding when you go to call on your buyers that now there's a millennial sitting at that desk. And that's the way it's always been. Uh, when I started my career, I, my primary people I sold to were about 28 to 32 years old. Today, those are millennials. And a lot of the people that buy promotional products today are millennials. Their defining idea is authenticity. They want things to be real. Their idea of money is earn it to spend it, but they're not going to be like boomers and, and, and spend it and then earn it. They're going to earn it and then spend it. This group is the first group that is really digital natives. No matter how much I study, how much I work at being um, technology savvy, I am always going to be a technology immigrant, uh, a digital immigrant. But Gen Ys are digital natives. They grew up with it. Uh, you may remember when the iPhone and the iPads came out that they were testing them with like two-year-old kids and you may have seen some of the uh, parents with children at, at malls and in restaurants with two-year-olds 
holding a screen in their hand. That's the way it was for Gen Y. They grew up with technology, all, all access, all the time, texting, the smartphone. It's been part of their life forever. <clears throat> it's 9 o'clock. Where are they? They're going to be out with friends, but they're going to have that screen in their hand. They're going to be punching that, that phone. They're going to be staying connected with all of their friends. A lot of other generations criticize millennials as being um, antisocial, but actually they're extremely social and they're constantly in contact. Music, Eminem and Lady Gaga, they view work as a chance to do some good. And this is a generation that will, uh, will give up an offer for a lot of money in order to take a job that provides some meaning. Their defining moments, they grew up with the prosperity that us boomers were enjoying so much during the 90s and uh, the prosperity of the 90s, the uh, go-go, the tech bubble, the real estate bubble and all of that. They were defined by that technology revolution. They were also a generation that learned that school's not a safe place. Columbine and following Columbine, all of the other instances of public gun violence that, that we've had has been part of their life. But this is a group that views their parents as friends, uh, and, the, and that relationship is different than the type of rebellious thing that us boomers had. Really view, view their parents as friends, their, their parents were great drivers for them, they taxied them at the eating rink at 8 o'clock, you've got your piano lesson at noon, and we're going to go play soccer at 2 o'clock. Um, that was a, a kind of a different role for parents in this group's life. All of us were affected by 9-11, but this is a group that, for them, that was what Pearl Harbor was to the silence. 9-11 uh, was happened when they were very young and, and was had a very strong impact. Many millennials don't know of our nation ever not being at war. Uh, they've experienced the Gulf War, the Iraq War, the Afghanistan Stan War. The United States has been always at war. Uh, as they were in uh, influential years, they watched the president with the whole Mon Mon Monica Lewinsky scandal and the Clinton um, scandal that went along with that. They saw an election where the popular vote went to one, pro one candidate and the election was handed over to the other candidate and the whole hanging chads thing. Social media and then the Great Recession of 2007-8 um, affected them greatly. When you're engaging them, make sure that you're concise, be upfront, be yourself. They're a group that's looking for immediate gratification. So quick service, quick turnaround is something that they're going to be looking for. Offer something for free. This is a great group to sell using uh, spec samples. It's also a, a great group to be bringing your self-promotion samples to. Make sure you're utilizing technology with them. Ask them if they prefer that to be reached by text. They probably do. Some may even prefer just through a Facebook Messenger. Utilize technology because that's the way they want to be um, communicated with. Be very open and don't be a hater. Don't be judgmental. Uh, keep your judgmental views to yourself. Uh, millennials do not like haters. Build up their self-esteem. Uh, let them know that you appreciate their, their college education, their hard work. Um, compliment them on the work they do, the, the preparation they've done. What you want to do is position yourself as a trusted guide. As I mentioned, this is a group very comfortable with their parents, very good friends with their parents. If you're much older, if you're an Xer or, or a boomer, try to put yourself into that, feel, that feeling of being like a parent to them and help them make good decisions. You're going to want to manage your reputation. That goes to what I said about not being a hater or, or judgmental, but you're going to want to remain popular so that uh, a millennial can refer you to another millennial, that they, they feel comfortable with you. Using testimonials is important with this group. Showing social responsibility. This is a group where product safety messages are going to resonate well. Tying in with charitable causes is going to resonate well. But again, use their technology preference, not your own. The millennials. 
They're the most diverse generation in American history. Um, they're set apart by their technology, um, by their their pop culture, and by their their music. They're also, well, they have real strong social responsibility values and and planet values. 25% of them are without religion. Uh, they're the least religious generation in American history. So, again, that whole judgment thing remain rather neutral but very positive. A, a, a degree of humanism and uh, respect for respect for all religions and a respect for um, good values is going to resonate with them. 40% have a ta tattoo. 74% feel that technology makes life easier. So make sure that you're, uh, you're using technology to that end. I kind of rushed through the last part because I'm getting real close to the end of my time with you. Here is my contact information. As I mentioned, I, uh, I will send a handout uh, over to SAGNI so that they can distribute it to you on, on request. And this uh, presentation will be available um, on their YouTube channel. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Otherwise, it's back to you. Okay, thank you, Paul, so much for that. Um, some had questions about how to, you know, um, an outline on how to um, connect with uh, each generation, which you've done already. So that was the only question that was asked out there. Um, okay. But again, uh, like Paul said, this seminar has um, this webinar has been recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, the link to the YouTube channel is on our website, on the front page. Um, if you guys have any other questions, please e feel free to email me. I can forward them to Paul, or you can have Paul's email address right in front of us, paul at brandkiwi.com. Um, Paul, thank you so much again. I appreciate it. And everyone is uh, thanking you for a great presentation. Thank you very much. It's been right, my pleasure. Thank you all. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're Bye -bye. welcome. Take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon.